name's Erin Carlson and I live in Summerland, British Columbia. So when I, was, when I was born, my parents lived in the Northwest Territories and my dad worked on the pipeline and they decided to move back down to where it was warm and there weren't any mosquitoes. <laughs> my mom grew up in Penticton, which is just down the road and so they decided the Okanagan was a good place and bought this bought this farm and it was an old orchard with old cherry trees and apple trees and everything on it and none of it was really very productive and so it all got ripped out and replanted and over my lifetime it's been replanted again and again and there's a few trees left that are from the first planting but most of them have um, come and gone already so it was something that always changed and it's kind of neat to watch it continue to evolve and to be part of it. I think I started sorting cherries when I was about 12 <laughs> and that's and then started managing people and um, taking over certain aspects of it by the age of 15. So one of, one of the things about where this location we're at right now is that it's, it's one of the latest places um, to grow cherries in the Western Hemisphere. We're in, the, we're in a valley and we're in the north and you know, we don't finish cherry harvest till the end of August, sometimes first week of September with the late, late varieties that were bred in Summerland. And so we also know that because they were bred here and they were, all the testing was done on the conditions in Summerland and all of the work has been done by people that we actually know personally, it kind of makes it more comfortable and more likely to succeed right where we are. One of the biggest challenges in growing the late season fruit is that it sits on the tree for so long and it's a soft fruit and it's sort of you know there's a lot of pressure from spotted wing, uh, mildew, all other things, rain, I mean that the season just goes on and on and on and to keep protecting everything over and over um, can co start costing a lot of money but is also quite cumbersome. You start losing stems if it's too hot out, you know, there's a lot of reasons to try and get your crop off early. But I think that we're learning every year a little bit more about how to keep those cherries good and to keep the quality up and, you know, looking at different ways to prune so we have bigger fruit, looking at different ways to cover them and protect them from insects, um, protect them from birds, protect them from rain. We're starting to look at those things and I think that technology is helping us do that. You talk to farmers that have been here forever and they talk about how they used to just have to spray once or twice a year. And you realize that that means they were spraying a lot of stuff that um, maybe shouldn't have been sprayed and we're glad we don't spray anymore, right? So a lot of the stuff that we spray now is gonna reduce the impact on the environment, but it also means more work for the farmer because you're going through every week and it means more um, pressure because the pests aren't actually getting controlled the same way as they maybe used to be but I think that's a that's a positive thing and it's only going to get um, it's only going to get more and more you know we, we ship a lot of fruit into Europe and our MRLs are really strict if we if we have anything that's over any limit um, we could get in big trouble there's a lot of more restrictions on what we can and cannot use even in Canada compared to down in Washington they talk about some stuff down there and you know they you're like, oh, we could do that. And then you realize that's not even registered and not allowed in Canada. And it, it makes you wonder if it's because of regulation or, you know, money, what it is. But we, we are already restricted and we try our best to stay sustainable through that. You know, there's this whole world of the whole global food system that we're involved in with the fruit that goes all over the world and the trade shows that happen and everybody's under one roof and they're all talking about this and we're part of that massive system and it's not just so if you know if you're someone who doesn't really want to be a farmer there's still huge opportunities in agriculture to be involved and to uh, make a living and to understand how the industry works and how the food system works and how all of that is so connected that um, getting an education is one thing getting an economics degree is fine but you know maybe talking about agricultural economics and talking about um, you know soil science all of these things are uh, their, their agriculture as much as what we do here on the farm and I think that we need to keep on encouraging people to participate in all the different aspects of agriculture.